Hey, everyone, and welcome to today's discussion around fast tracking innovation. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. And um, this is a podcast around non-obvious kind of perspectives around the latest trends, challenges, and opportunities in medtech. Uh, I'm Sava Marinkovich. I'm part of HTech Group, and I'll be hosting today's panel. Uh, and uh, what does it mean to be fast tracking innovation in medtech? Uh, we have a great panel um, from across the spectrum in healthcare. Uh, we'll go through a little round robin of introductions right now. I'll ask the rest of the panelists to um, turn on their uh, video cameras now and, and to welcome everyone. And then um, uh, I'd like to go through uh, in a totally randomized controlled order of introductions, uh, starting with uh, Adriano. Adriano, um, please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Good morning. And uh, thank you, Sava and uh, Nemanja. Uh, first, first of all, I want to thank you and, and the team for the invitation to be part of this panel. And I'll bring uh, that perspective uh, into the discussion of better ways to accelerate high quality evidence generation to maximize that impact of medtech and health tech products. Uh, so my name is Adriano Garces and I work for ZS. Uh, ZS is a global healthcare consulting firm that supports life sciences, health tech and medtech all the way from uh, R&D to commercial. And, uh, and in my role as, as Director of Evidence Generation and Outcomes, I, I really focused on helping pharma and, and health tech DTX manufacturers. So I'm more focused on software as a medical device. And I help them in understanding what those evidence needs are, what are the evidence needs for payers and regulators, how to optimize the uh, generation of evidence, helping decide which study designs are more appropriate to answer the key questions and uh, you know, supporting them in the conduct of, of those studies to develop the right value stories that then uh, will influence uh, or will feed into regulatory clearance, health plan coverage, and, and reimbursement considerations. So thanks, thanks again for having me, for having me, and uh, I look forward for for this discussion. Great, thank you, Adriano. Um, appreciate you uh, joining us today. Uh, Mete, uh, would you please go ahead and uh, uh, introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, my name is Mette Dyberg. I'm from Legoland, also known as Denmark. I like to build things. So I'm here to sort of present the innovation perspective on this conversation. I am the CEO and founder of MIMI. We're the market leader in autoimmune disease reversal in this behavioral health space. Um, we're really coming at this disease space from a point of trigger identification. So to some, it would look like a diagnostic, but it really is a software protocol that is delivered uh, digitally. And I look forward to this conversation because nobody ever showed me the signage to where the fast lane was in MedTech. <laughs> great, great, great to have you. Um, uh, with that, I'll pass this on to Dev. Dev, uh, please go ahead. I saw the team, this is uh, Dave Callion. I found it Dave, it's spelled D-E-V, makes it hard for everyone. Uh, I am a, uh, a uh, neuro-ophthalmologist by trade, a clinical effectiveness researcher by choice, um, a veteran, uh, was active duty Navy until 2016, and then um, really came to the, the Department of Veterans Affairs leadership layer to start to think about how to modernize their health system and transition from a, uh, a federated delivery system to an integrated payer provider focused on value. I'm actually at the VHA Innovation Exchange today at the National Press Club in DC. So you might hear a little bit of noise around me, but uh, really an exciting forum where we are pushing forward innovation in a, in a system that has to be rural, highly rural, urban, and everything in between, and focusing not just on cost and quality, but also on equity, access, and patient experience, being able to create a trusted data ecosystem to be able to test capability that is not just med tech, not just health tech, but changes in workflow, changes in all the other parts of how you deliver care and pay for it in order to make sure that people have as frictionless experience as possible and you get the best outcomes you can with uh, adherence to the taxpayer's funds. So thank you for this and I'll be on mute for most of this. Great, thank you. Very happy to have you with us um, in your perspectives. Uh, and finally, I'll pass on to Nemanja. 
Thanks, Sava. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Nemanja Kovacev. I'm a medtech expert here at HTEC Group. Uh, I'm an orthopedic and trauma surgeon with a PhD in orthopedic surgery and digital health. Uh, I'm also a software engineer uh, working predominantly in Java, C Sharp. Uh, and I have some 15 years of combined medical and engineering experience here in digital health space. Great. And um, I'll just say, I um, appreciate that, Nemanja. And uh, so uh, my name again is Sava. I'm the head of the health tech uh, practice here at HTEC Group. And I have the privilege of seeing a lot of different perspectives around innovation from small to large and figuring out how to, how to accelerate building those especially. Um, so on a couple administrative points, there's a, for all the attendees, there's a question and answer box. Uh, we won't be, we'll, we'll accept your questions, but uh, we'll answer them in more fuller format uh, after the webinar. So we'll take a look at these and, and uh, either some of us, all of us, or at least one of us uh, would write a uh, response to the questions, uh, and then we'll share those with all the attendees afterwards. We think that would be a, a much better use of everyone's time and, um, and give you more thoughtful responses that maybe some of the questions uh, require. Um, <clears throat> so with that, uh, let's begin. Um, what I'd like to open up with, um, with um, Nemanja is, is your perspective, because you've been in the medical space, you, you're very good in technology. Um, why, is, why is medical device innovation hard in your perspective? And can you explain just, roughly how you see the general process. And thank you, Sawa. Um, well, to put it short, uh, medical space is one of the most complex uh, landscapes in the industry. There are a lot of stakeholders. So when you're trying to innovate, you have to align uh, to the interests of all stakeholders involved in the process. So when you're building a product, for example, you have a great idea, you have to check whether that idea is working, whether it has some physiological impact and benefits to patients. But after that, you need to see how to incorporate that product of yours into the existing uh, workflow. And last but not least, uh, who is gonna pay for that? So basically without those points, you cannot succeed in, in, in medical space. So it's a very specific area. It's not a standard area where you have your target customer, your target client. You have your end customer here as a patient, for example, but your target, target audience is, for example, doctors, payers, providers. So it's very complex to navigate. And uh, many founders start working on a great product, but they don't have enough info about what does it take to be fully incorporated in the in the, the vast medical space? So that can be a really really a big hurdle on the way. Okay, so then what that brings up to mind is where 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 does the predominantly innovation in the med tech space come from? Does it come from the patient? Does it come from the practitioner saying I got a great idea? Uh, does it come from a technologist that says, why are you doing this the wrong way? Or, or is it pushed by like finance and the, the payers saying like, look, these this has got to be done a different way. That's an op open quote. What do you think, Mimini? And then Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a tough, to so tough, four, tough one too. Four choices. <laughs> Where's the primary or how much? How much <laughs> four choices. Yeah, that, that, that's a tough one to, to answer, uh, especially in these, these days of, of uh, increased interest in digital health due to the pandemic. So the innovation comes from all directions. I mean, from physicians, from patients, for there are some problems that, that payers and providers want to solve. So they initiate uh, some innovation, uh, but- Yeah, I wouldn't forget the caregivers as well, right? So the, yeah, the, the you think of care as patient and we build longitudinal records around the patient, but if you really think about the relationship as being with the nucleus of the family and the caregivers and building Absolutely. that caregiver ecosystem, it's a much broader conversation, um, Sava, I think, than just 
where does it come from? It's more, how do you harness all of that innovation and those ideas and then move them into uh, some kind of accelerated innovation workflow to be able to bring them to market through all the regulatory hurdles and all of the payment structures that you talked about. Absolutely. So does, um, so Dev, to your, to your point on this one, um, I mean, when the idea comes up, there's this, uh, you know, idea hypothesis that comes in and then you're testing and then you're kind of hypothesizing. Is that, is that pretty straightforward or do you see that differently in, in the different areas? Um, innovation wise. Yeah. So that's, a, that's a good question. I, I think, uh, it's again, it's it's a little bit of all of the above, right? So there's top-down innovation in large systems. There's bottoms-up innovation. There's folks who are doing things on the ground internally within the direct care system, and then they're they are partnering with outside partners to augment their care. Uh, all of those elements. So I'm not just thinking about medical devices here, but truly the entire workflow of care delivery uh, and all of the processes to transform it. Uh, how you harness that innovation in your system towards your end goals um, is, is really important. And then setting the vision for what you're trying to accomplish as an organization and sharing that, allowing those folks to say, this is something that's going to contribute to that. Here's how I can come to find you with my idea. Um, you know, in the VA, we've built shark tanks and diffusion of excellence. In fact, the, the current undersecretary for health started at the VA building the diffusion of excellence program for the innovation ecosystem seven or eight years ago as a presidential innovation fellow. So, so I think it's exactly that. We now have a $650 million in, uh, IDIQ vehicle for advancing innovation and learning in the health system. So, uh, and, and the Mission Act uh, has given us section 152 to change the way that we pay for care uh, with authorities to be able to buy not just outsourced care, but rather building ways to better integrate partners in the community, industry, capability, and the delivery system for the largest delivery, integrated delivery system in the United States. Do you think the, uh, that's really interesting, did, did the shark take concept, uh, th did you see a noticeable change in how quickly ideas came out? Or, or Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, spark, spread, spark, Spread, seed spread innovation that came out of this space has, has, has I mean, uh, this entire innovation ecosystem that I'm sitting in today at this event is a shark tank tomorrow with ideas from all over every chief health informatics officer in the country who's got good ideas and has been app implementing them is coming together to talk to each other about what they're doing and then how they might be able to adapt that in a system that includes standardized work workflows, standardized technology stacks, uh, and, a, and a cybersecurity environment that allows us to build all of this with a single digital transformation center. So that that's exactly what you need in a large system to be able to consume innovation and understand how to apply it and uh, test it continuously uh, with, you know, in first in one place, scale it, assess continuously with a trusted data ecosystem to drive that. I got one more follow-up there, Deb. So is the fact, um, do you see everything on the early part of the innovation faster, but you still have the same amount of time on the back end of getting those actually into market or in use in practice? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I'd like to hear from some of the audience and uh, some of the other participants and how their uh, journey has gone in the commercial side. I think it's faster to market in an innovation ecosystem that looks like this, this has never existed in the American healthcare system at scale. You've got the Kaiser Innovation Space, you've got the Mayo Clinic doing some of this innovation space with John Halamka and his digital uh, innovation. I, I think those, those are the models that we're looking at, um, but the innovators who are trying to come in um, need to know where those front doors are have a better way to interact with and show the, the, the business case or the case for value and then have a way to generate the evidence they need for folks like the FDA and others to say, this makes sense. Let's try this with a trusted system that's, that, that they believe that um, they can replicate or at least get similar results towards their own goals. That's, that's I think, been the continuous challenge. These companies are going C-suite to C-suite trying to sell their wares at the value-based organizations that exist in the system, which are you know ACOs, Managed Medicaid, Medicare Part C, a little bit of the, you know, the Geisingers of the world, but they, 
they, there aren't kind of core integrated markets at scale in the United States to be able to go to, to, uh, to with a trusted set of evidence that we all are saying, this makes sense, let's take it and try it in the next place. Yeah, I, I would like to touch on uh, two very important aspects that from my experience um, and the, the, the types of innovators I, I dealt with that I, I feel it's, it's crucial in accelerating innovation to market. One is what Dev and, and Nemanja uh, uh, already mentioned is, is a, a full understanding of first the product life cycle, right? Uh, having clarity on um, the intended use of the product, the user segments uh, from patient, clinician, uh, and then even payer, right? So if the solution uh, solves a core clinical need of the patient, uh, if the solution uh, creates that uh, uh, clinical leverage uh, that uh, adds value to the way that the uh, provider will end up delivering care. So that value uh, needs to be captured through clear evidence, tangible evidence. And then when approaching payers, if uh, deciding early if the payer and reimbursement is your one of the pathways for commercialization and long-term sustainability of the product, you need to understand what are the needs of the payers, right? And if there are sub-segments of payers, uh, you need to understand for that product, for that patient segment, how do they manage the patients, right? What are the big ticket items in terms of uh, keeping uh, those premiums, that's those health plan premiums in check. Uh, how do you maximize the value of that plan to uh, the plan members, right? How can you prevent uh, more severe um, health episodes by introducing this new solution? So from an innovator standpoint, that should be baseline, that baseline understanding should be mapped out from the get-go. Uh, and uh, because the evidence generation is a journey. And like Dev was, was saying, I mean, uh, there's a clear distinction that we, we, we need to make in terms of getting to the market. There is entering the market with an FDA regulated product. And in this case, what, while the patient safety and clinical utility and clinical benefits are, are demonstrated through these RCT, RCTs and other types of studies that generate high quality evidence for entering the market with a regulatory clearance, this clearance is just a start. It's not the guarantee that a product is going to be covered, it's going to be accessible by patients uh, of a health plan, or that claims will be reimbursed for the use and prescription of this device. So the point I wanted to make is that evidence generation and the planning of that evidence has to be uh, 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 very tightly, um, uh, it has to be purposeful, right? FDA clearance has some level of requirements. Patient have those needs, those clinical benefits that they need to see as part of the utilization of that solution. Providers need to see the clinical utility and the integration points with usual care, right? Um, we don't want to introduce uh, a completely new disruptive ways of managing care. We want to augment and add value to how, uh, Claire, uh, 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 how care is being delivered. And then, you know, having all those proof points from an economic standpoint to prove those economic outcomes that patient that that uh, uh, then the health plans will will consider for for reimbursements. Um, so that's uh, I think that that's fundamental to accelerate um, uh, the solution to market. It's less about getting to market fast, but getting to market with the right proof points that will sustain your your solution over time. Adriana, thanks. Mette, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I, I think I would. So I think, you know, Nemanja said in the beginning, you, what are all the different stakeholders that are sort of coming into this space? And full disclosure, I'm not a physician, I'm an economist. And when you come into the space with an innovation, but you don't have the language, that alone sort of is the first barrier, right? You, you go from hospital to hospital, but you're not necessarily saying the things that they need to hear. And so for us, um, we really quite early said to each other, well, we can see that the outcomes are there, but how do we then get to sort of the commercialization and, and the things that really matter? 
And it became relatively early clear to us that the finances drove healthcare, drives healthcare in the US to a much larger extent than any other parameters. So while we were doing all of our outcomes testing, we really uh, focused mostly on the, um, the value-based model with payers. And so simultaneously we're testing the product efficacy and um, payer you know, cost savings. And the reason for that was really to be able to, at the end of the day, say, this is how, I, how the efficacy work, but this is also how much we can impact you as a payer, whether we are you know, looking for clients or whether we are looking for an acquisition or whatever we'll be looking for in the future. Bottom line is that you have to be able to monetize what you do in a big way in order for actually enter this market. And I think we've, we've seen the, the old model of doing pilots with the crisis of this world um, be extinct. Uh, you know, at some point I was talking to John Hopkins and he told me they had over a hundred diabetes trials simultaneously. That's a hundred small companies thinking that we'll get to the end of this trial and we made it. Clearly they don't need a hundred different solutions, right? Uh, that's a that's a fantastic point. Um, to address that, I want to put up. We have a slide up here showing the general pace, um, average pace of innovation in different industries. Uh, let me see if I can get that up on the screen. But by the way, Dev, the initiative that you just described seems amazing. I don't know if it's going to necessarily have sort of like a fast lane but it's definitely going to be better than what we've seen so far. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. The, um, so, so, you know, it's, it's a journey. This is not a, a, a single, of, uh, but, but having a place where we can generate the evidence, focus on that and build it out in a way that then you can invite companies in. You know, there used to be a time where VCs ran away if you were focusing on government, um, where now there's entire organizations that are looking at mission-oriented companies and understanding, you know, that, that there's a value to focusing on, on this space in particular. Um, I think of it as, again, the two integrated payer providers, the military health system and the Veterans Health Administration, as the two places where they have both the taxpayer responsibility of paying for care, as well as the responsibility for delivering that care and the longitudinal relationship with the patient. You can't forget that part of it. So that patient is always a veteran and that family and the caregivers are always veterans, caregivers, families. So building capability for them today that reduces total cost of care and improves their outcomes uh, is going to benefit you today and it's going to benefit you in 20 years. That's one of the challenges we have with the American healthcare system is that attribution becomes really, really challenging. And they're looking in the commercial space at what, do we, what are you going to do for me today? And then in, in some ways, I've seen companies that are able to build risk corridors, generate reduction in costs prove that out with attribution for a couple of years with randomized controlled trials and quasi randomized controlled trials. And then three years later are kicked out because they're saving too much money and there needs to be a different way to attribute it or there's different leadership that comes in the door. So that, there's really a, a, a lot of challenges to getting sticky with transforma transformative capability in the health tech and med tech markets. I, I just would like to add on, on that, Dev. So, and, and as we see the, uh, you know, the, pay, the, the payer market is actually picking up. I think it was a couple of days ago with a Highmark uh, announcement, right? Uh, where they came up with this uh, medical policy um, that, you know, sets the ground for, uh, uh, you know, set, sets a, a pathway for technologies that want to get into their system and to be accepted in their system. There's a clear guidance or more clear guidance on what they need to, to demonstrate. And I believe that Highmark is it's the first large commercial insurer to signal that intends to pay for claims for the use of, of apps and, and help treat. Uh, I, I think the focus now is uh, psychiatric disorders and, and other complex, complex conditions, but they just approved, for instance, Endeavor RX uh, from uh, Achille, uh, you know, pair therapeutics, uh, 
uh, they, uh, you know, other uh, insomnia uh, related uh, uh, technologies, um, virtual reality treatments for, I think it, it was for chronic lower, lower back uh, and even lazy eye. So there's a lot of innovation uh, and there are some 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 payers uh, and and especially payer provider organizations, IVN type of organizations, that have a test bed uh, of, to you know quickly uh, uh, fuel innovation by deploying and having access to to patients and and to do early innovation uh, with 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 providers and and, and patients, um, but uh, the. Seeing that the, the 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 payer market is 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 really picking up and and bringing clarity as uh, the companies that are trying to come to the market should understand where those pathways exist, right? How is demonstration of value be, being done, right? Even recently, uh, payer, uh, uh, you know, they were they they are already uh, reimbursed. I think in uh, you know sixteen uh, uh, sixteen payers uh, right now, but still. They a couple months ago they focused on demonstrating value on healthcare utilization, like you were, like you, like you were, uh, you were, uh, uh, um, you were pointing to, and they were very specific in the type of outcomes that they wanted to demonstrate for their, I think, so the the summary uh, uh, insomnia management solution. They focus on showing, you know, tangible economic outcomes around. Uh, emergency department visits based on real world data, right? Uh, the use of the impact of the use of the solution in hospitalizations, ambulatory surgical uh, uh, center visits, other right. outpatient visits, and 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 so the my point is that there are still there are already some uh, uh, evidence that the payer, uh, uh, the payer market is, is picking up and there are frameworks that should be okay. used as reference for innovation. So, so I think one of the challenges, Sava, just to finish the thought, that the, the, the care ecosystem is spreading, right? There's not, it's not just built in these large kind of monoliths anymore who are challenging to get shared data from. So now with the, you know, with the, um, the TECFA, the, the trusted exchange framework uh, that, that will be, it, uh, the trusted exchange framework and common agreement that I think will help to democratize the availability of data, um, the ability for patients to carry their own um, uh, uh, personalized health record across health systems and generate their own um, evidence base that they can share with their own personally owned and personally managed privileges it will allow us to start to do things like design security around all of this allow us to say, let's let's get the evidence to the different players in the market and share it in a way that they can understand the value, I'm going to put that in quotes, of their innovation as they come to market. Where in the past, you had to find an innovator inside of a health system who had enough patients to be able to populate your, your trial and then get the, the evidence base. We're, we're a lot closer to the other side of this now where, where we can use the initiatives of the past 20 years um, to, to generate both a clinical evidence base, a claims and financial evidence base, as well as really all of the elements of a patient's health journey all the way down to their financial transactions, their search history, their shopping history with CVS. All of those pieces are available to us. We just need to start to figure out how to organize them, syndicate them in a longitudinal record with capabilities like MD clone. I think we're a lot closer to that than we were 20 years ago. Yeah. Uh, and, and, I, and I also think just to add to what Dev says is what one of the things, at least in my field, that's going to be the most important change of guards here is that real world evidence will be a de facto standard in a lot of behavioral health. Uh, you know, the way we've done clinical research almost was in direct opposition to innovation in this field because these double blinded RCTs were almost impossible because of the, the, the fussiness when it came to what are we actually measuring in the control group? Um, and even if you did your very best, there would be somebody questioning whether that was the right thing to do. Um, so I think real world evidence will really be what, what really breaks open this uh, innovation. I think those are uh, three fantastic points from from uh, all of you. I, uh, from the payer market, 
dynamic um, to this uh, kind of care ecosystem and this kind of um, portability of data and, and this that enables this real world ev uh, evidence. I wanna put up two slides real quick. A first slide um, basically was just a historical timeline of um, in different industries of time to market for different products. And when you look at pharma, you used to have the longest and what has shown uh, and then aerospace, but what's shown, what COVID has shown is that there are ways to accelerate very quickly. Um, kind of uh, emergency authorizations help, uh, but even that, even after that, it, it kind of, uh, some of these innovations in that space can go faster and so forth as it goes down. And we look at the technology curves of how quickly new phones, new technologies, and the number of kind of um, media source channels uh, where we receive information have all been accelerating over time. What I want to point out, though, and go to the, and there's another slide here, which is this breakdown. When we look at, um, we kind of made a cut of kind of four different areas in the space. Um, at the top part is this kind of digital only space, could be um, digital diagnostics, uh, as well as digital therapeutics. And um, there's the traditional medical device that's hardware oriented, both on a diagnostic and therapeutic side, as well as the um, a category, let's call it lifestyle, health and wellness that are, that are not specifically regulated as medical devices, but have impact on patient health. health. And then there's this platform and pathway view Kind of across the board, and that that could have different flavors of diagnostic and therapeutic, and something in between. Let's call it operational. In these eight areas, uh, I want to first put up a question that says, um, out of these areas, which one is the most exciting uh, right now? I think we might have a poll for this too. Um, let me just see if we can get that up. Um, but if you look at those eight areas, and um, uh, I don't know if the panelists see the poll, but the participants should see a poll coming up. Um, uh, what do you think is the most interesting, uh, exciting space in terms of accelerating new innovations? So Again, you have kind of two sides of the coin in each one of these verticals, between digital, between hardware, this wellness area, and this platform side. Um, we'll give a little bit of time. This attendees can uh, answer this, and I'll just ask our hosts when that uh, when is that going to be uh, when is that poll complete? But um, I think we got most of the answers in. Uh, so let me go around the bed. What do you think from this perspective? Digital therapeutics is very exciting. It's it's a hot button between what's happening in Highmark and peer therapeutics and stuff and Meti and what you're doing in terms of the on on this digital view. What what it? Let's start with what's most exciting. That's not your own space, maybe. <laughs> Adriano, <laughs> I'll point. I'll start with you first. Well, with me. Well, I. I, I think that um, there's a lot, still a lot to be untapped with um, AI and ML. Um, so machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence in, uh, in, in the digital space, um, digital health space is, is, is huge. Um, the ability to recognize uh, patterns in massive amounts of data and take those patterns and uh, uh, being able to identify and predict um, some some health events, um, we are just scratching the surface. But bringing more um, automated recognition of those pa pa patterns and helping clinicians then uh, making those better decisions and creating that clinical leverage, I, I think it's a, an area of immense opportunity. Um, and that we'll see in the in the next uh, you know five to ten years uh, probably hitting that uh, 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 hockey stick curve um, dramatically. Um, and uh, I would like to be to be part of that. Uh, the solutions that I've 
I've uh, uh, helped bring to the market uh, are still very nascent um, in terms of using ML, um, but I think that's a huge opportunity. Yeah. Great point. I, I can't help but look at the poll. <laughs> well, the poll is uh, not, uh, it may not be a completely representative sample. So there might be some- uh, no, but, I, but I still think it's an intriguing outline, right? Because in general, it's it it by far diagnostics outweigh therapeutics like it's more than double in every category even the ones where therapeutics don't really exist it's it's still diagnostic first and i think that's already sort of a predominant trait in the way we've thought of standard of care right mm -hmm. standard of care is you come in you have a symptom something gets measured something gets labeled, now you have a diagnosis, then a prescription follows, and then now you're in treatment for whatever your, your diagnosis was. Um, we, in many ways, I think are on the cusp where diagnostic gets more and more interesting. I personally, like Adriano, I'm like AI ML is sort of where the fun is, but if you really think about it, diagnostics have been um, for a part of the conversation, but not for the entire conversation. We, in my space, we have three out of four failing the predominant drugs. If there was a test that could show whether it was actually working, that would be a tremendous. That's right. Yeah. However, so, so that's actually. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. But if we look at diagnostics or therapeutics, I'm actually sort of hoping that the next innovation will be that we're actually looking more towards the therapeutic end versus the diagnostic end. Go ahead, Dev. Yeah, yeah I, so I, I think this framework, uh, and you know you know me, I'm, I'm not a, I, all frameworks to me are, are challenged, but the, the center is really um, the orchestration of all of these elements, right? So, so diagnostics shouldn't be just on the left of the journey. It's continuous evaluation of the data as it comes in and then ability to titrate what we're doing for and with patients to be able to improve their well-being is 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 really the the nature of what I think is going to be the future of health and wellness. So we're we're thinking now about orchestration platforms. How do you uh, kind of tighten the revenue cycle to be able to pay those different actors in the journey? I, what I think the poll represents is not so much um, what people are most excited about, but but where the um, where their efforts are focused today. But if you look at them, there are folks on all of those. And so how we then organize all of the elements of the care journey and the care systems. So I'm thinking about staffing, I'm thinking about being able to get a trained and educated workforce, um, building um, a security layer for the data architecture, thinking about how then you organize the care delivery elements to be able to drive all of that through and focus on moving as many people to the top of their license as possible with data and innovation to allow you to use technology at the left side of that. Again, I'm using a, a structure, but the, the, the lower end of the cardiology license to be able to get all those EKG reads out of the way or go, go in people's homes and use you know, AI around 2D echo to be able to do screening of, of algorithm qualified populations for congestive heart failure and get those patients on diuretics. That's the future to me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, the, the power of uh, machine learning will move that uh, care and diagnostics more into the pre prevention area. And that's like the ultimate goal to, to prevent as much things as possible and not to even have to come into the situation to have to, to treat an illness or, or, or something uh, similar. But uh, to, to return to the, the, the poll, to me, I have to say, maybe it's because <laughs> of surgical perspective, but to me, it's like uh, uh, hardware and uh, therapeutics and hardware, it's it's one of the most interesting areas that we will see a development in the next years uh, because of, of all the development of haptics, uh, robotics, uh, like uh, virtual surgery, VR, and all those uh, technologies that will, that will uh, 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 fall into that group. So this would 
this will be, be really interesting, interesting to watch. I think, um, so there's a couple, first, let me put a plug in for the audience to enter questions into the Q&A as they come up or even comments. Uh, again, we'll get to those. Um, I, I wanted to bring up a couple points, especially around this dynamic of how much do you diagnose? How does that lead into therapeutic? And then it, this continuous loop you were talking about, Devin, I agree that it's not so pristine, but in the eyes many times of the FDA, it is and regulatory bodies. And so that kind of force, it's a forcing function of getting things into one of these two categories. And maybe that is ripe for change as well. Uh, but the but there's another assumption in there that says, is the problem that we don't know what's wrong with you and there's enough treatments or is it that we're just diagnosis is the easier part that we can get something in because we can measure the effects later of a therapeutic. So, so di uh, therapeutics will always be lagging to diagnostics because we're understanding the problem only after the di more advanced understanding of it. So, and then is, is the return less on therapeutics because you can get very good investment in, uh, out of a very good return out of investing time and effort on the diagnostic side and just keep yeah. the palliative therapeutics existing. It's, you know, incremental compared to the so, diagnostic side. I, so I'd like I, to take a swing at that. If, uh, go ahead, go ahead, Mike. No, no, go ahead. So, so I, I want to, uh, one, I think the FDA point is really clear, right? So, so something about how evidence generation is really around whether it's clinically effective. They're not looking at cost. They're not looking at the value proposition, just whether it's safe and effective. And then it's a binary decision of yes or no. So they get really challenged at the FDA when you think of an AI or ML software that is going to continuously learn and change its algorithm downstream and take care of people in different ways that they didn't necessarily anticipate. I'm not an Eric Schmidt or Elon Musk and the robots will take over the world, but I am um, you know, somewhat wary of how that all gets put together. And, and in fact, the VA and the FDA have put together a center in Seattle specifically to look at the regulatory framework around AI and ML. I'm not sure there's gonna be any good answers there um, other than to build an effectiveness uh, ecosystem of trusted data for us to be able to look at post-market surveillance more broadly. Um, so that's that's one. Um, the 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 second thing I think um, we, we probably need to um, kind of step up our our concept of what healthcare is to think of social care, healthcare, wellness as just care, and it's not care in the home or physical care. It's just care. How do you build care delivery in a way that's designed around how humans want to interact with it is the question that's the, I think the folks who do that human centered design the best are the ones who are going to succeed in building out functional and effective capability into our, into our health system more broadly. Go I ahead, Mete, say, sorry. Yeah. No, I, I, one, one commentary more than anything to your, to your sort of question is, well, if we've learned one thing in the last couple of years is that a diagnostic to show that you have COVID or not COVID has little, little value when there's very few answers to the questions around how do we help people. And so I think we are actually going to be looking at a healthcare system where the unknown causalities are going to start taking over. And it's going to be more and more common that people go to the doctor and say, it hurts here, here and here. And there's not going to be necessarily a really good answer or diagnostic that can that can pinpoint what's going on and prescribe a drug that can fix it. And I think as we are sort of coming more and more into this lifestyle era, we're actually going to see that being even more predominant trade. Um, so is that driven by the payers? Are the incentives misaligned for really getting health in the system because they, they tend to skew towards one side or the other? I would say 100%. You know, if you, if you can't prove that there is a disease, then what are you going to do about it? Uh, the, the reality is everybody is talking about preventative health. And as much as I love the idea fundamentally, um, I just don't believe that 
the time is here for the US yet, because unless there's a cost to cure, a payer is not interested. So we will always be coming in on the wrong side of the problem. Adriano. I think that the hepatitis oh, C ahead, drug, just, just, a, a, just a comment, the hepatitis C drug specifically, that, that I think was a, a great microcosm of what this challenge really looks like for the payers. You can cure hepatitis C, but it's gonna cost us $80,000. What should we do and who should take on the burden of that cost? Right, uh, and, and uh, you know, it, I think it, it brings us back to demonstrating beyond the clinical benefit of, of a medical device or digital therapeutic and, and zeroing in on understanding how payers or what are the healthcare utilization metrics that payers and providers seek, right? So, and being more objective in building that case and, and, and collecting that evidence, uh, you know, for, for instance, better managing uh, high cost patients, right? What are the metrics that will allow us to infer that? Um, uh, how does uh, the solution impact, for instance, a uh, big ticket item like ICU utilization? Um, and then we start getting into the more predictive, predictive aspect to it. Um, does the solution allow to identify risk factors that will lead to uh, increased severity of a condition, that will lead to more claims, that will lead to hospitalization, right? Uh, can we predict based on that pattern recognition, D, uh, it predicts some health outcomes, right? Um, and obviously overall, this will reduce healthcare costs as a whole. And like Seb was doing is considering care as this big journey, right, that goes from pre-diagnosis, uh, probably managing and recognizing those risk factors before it turns into a diagnosis, uh, then uh, tools that will help diagnose that, that solution or that will diagnose those solutions. And then after the patient is already diagno diagnosed, uh, solutions that help manage those patients and to control severity and, and aggravation of, of symptoms and, and disease states. So it depends on, on, on the solution, the type of innovation you're, you're catering to, but there's a, this overarching value case that needs to obviously for FDA to enter the market, the lowest bar, uh, and forgive me for saying lowest bar, but it's actually the one that has more clarity as the FDA is 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 very uh, tactic in terms of what they need to uh, clear the product, right? To allow that product to be put in the hands of the patients, its safety and its, you know, its clinical benefit. And then the, the rest is, you know, where, where the innovators lack and the solutions lack is to, uh, you know, to do the rest of the journey, which is to that uh, workflow integration, collect that data and to get to those proof points, uh, like like I described, that uh, that's what will really entice payers to get on board and to, you know, facilitate the utilization and the access of, of these solutions. So like a, a concrete example, Sava, so we I work with a company called Oxford VR. They built a breakthrough technology, FDA breakthrough for uh, uh, serious mental illness. Um, but that's just one gate. The next gate is how do you get that into practice? What is the uh, context and milieu that you're building these into and what kinds of patients are you generating that for? How do you build the infrastructure to de deploy VR and do it in an ethical and patient focused way and then create that human subjects research environment to be able to understand what the data is as you, you know, expand the use case from just that, um, you know, I think there's a, a term uh, um, in, uh, in gaming, uh, which is that, you know, the, the, use, the first user experience, uh, the TUI, um, first time user interface, I believe, or first time user experience, um, that then changes as you go through that environment. Those are really challenging transformations that we need, but how do we physically build out the infrastructure for a trusted data architecture that we can all look to. And I think that's the key word is trust. How do you build a system that we can look to and say that data is generated in a way that we can all believe it and can lift it from where it is and shift it to the next place which wants to use it. That's but, that's the critical infrastructure that we need. Okay, but do you think that some some of these innovations just start at the wrong time? They, they, the, the innovation is there, the idea is there, but they just don't have, their, it's too early because they don't have the surrounding dynamics that are going to uh, enable it. So data portability is is phenomenal, 
but th between the, um, you know, there's a lot of friction legally and regulatory wise, and just culturally as well, in some cases, about being able to move data around. Um, uh, don't, do you think some of these are, I mean, let's say what percentage of these are just simply the entrepreneur or the corporate project initiative is just at the wrong time? And, and how is that um, how is that vetted out quickly to 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 steer to the right to better ideas? I, I can take a shot. So, so the hypothesis testing that you alluded to earlier is not just in whether or not your technology is going or or process or workflow or um, hardware is going to achieve a better outcomes, but also how do you bring it to market? And so you need to have tests of how you actually bring that to market. Where is that uptake going to be? How do I fail it out? You know, my father worked for Iridium years ago, which was satellites all over the world to be able to deliver uh, 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 phone service. And it was, a, it was a wonderful project in the sense that it was going to be transformative and was going to work, but it wasn't financially viable for Motorola and they took a huge write-off. But those capabilities that they built for satellite <clears throat> those satellites are still flying around the world and still communicating with us today, right? So the, the, the idea is how do you find the technologies, restack them, continually test them, and then bring them to, <clears throat> bring them to the payers and providers that are going to bring, that are basically going to be your partners in delivering that care. That's, that's the health tech and med tech problem. But, but I also think that one sort of glaringly obvious thing, and I almost want to take it back to what excites you most outside of your own field, a question, consumerism. I think we are talking about patients and caregivers and payers and hospital providers. And we're sort of missing the point that there's also consumers and people's dollars will be a part of the voting game of the future. We are seeing it beginning now. We're not there yet, but I think the consumers will play a very big role in healthcare. As we are getting to a place of, you know, in my own case, I cracked a tooth during COVID and, you know, normally I go to the dentist in Denmark. So I had to find a new one. And I went to TEND, which is sort of like a concierge slash technology play. And it was the best consumer experience I've had. I've always hated the dentist. I can literally tell you that I promote TEND like it was like the best thing since sliced bread. Because the experience of going there, everything about it, from a technology point of view, from the interaction and so on and so forth, was amazing. Whereas like, I'm five months pregnant. I just got a letter this morning from an Aetna suggesting that I might be trying to get pregnant. I've had, I don't know, 15 scans. Now the AI has suggested that potentially maybe I'm there. It's, it's sort of, once we meet the patient where they are, we will win no matter what horse we're betting on in this game. Absolutely. Um, it, it, uh, consumerism is, uh, can be a, a major pull into this. Um, I, I'd like to just touch on, uh, so once again, people in the audience, if you wanna throw a question in there, we'll, we'll answer these or our thoughts, throw them uh, in the Q and A um, chat right there. Um, Coming back to the kind of the, the core que uh, question, which is fast tracking innovation of the market. So between these areas, um, devices versus digital has um, more complexity as a result of having to physically build, test, have quality control in different regulatory systems. Um, and the skewing of, of these innovations, I've seen a lot of hardware diagnostic devices where the entrepreneur has solved a specific problem with a doctor on his team, physiologically works, everything is great. They can't get funding on it. Um, it makes a need. They're, they're still searching for a very large raise, uh, but they cannot, uh, they, they still can't raise the funds on it. So what happens is that just an entrepreneurial mistake or is it a structural mistake? Well, it can be an entrepreneurial mistake. So, you know, you that to, to get 
to what we talked uh, about uh, at the beginning of this webinar, you can get a great solution, but you're not aware of the whole system and then you will fail. But on the other side, maybe they haven't, for example, one such company, maybe uh, they haven't crafted a pitch uh, attractive enough to, you know, uh, attract some investors, or maybe they their product is not aligned, but is conflicting the interests of payers, providers, or uh, uh, any other stakeholders. So that's my two cents about it. I would just uh, quickly add that uh, I think the uh, one one of the the uh, key success factors again is, you know, if the solution functions from a clinical benefit standpoint, that's table stakes, right? But uh, if the innovator hasn't thought through their hypothesis for commercial pathways for business models, and like Mete was saying, you know, who is, who is the user who pays for it? Is it, you know, is this a direct to consumer play? Uh, is is well priced or not, right? Is does this go through a health plan? Okay, so what are the incentives for the health plan uh, to to have a bite at this? So I I think it's in in, in short is is lack of good planning and evidence based demonstration of value, um, and you know racing to get the product into the market without uh, uh, validating that commercial viability aspect also that I've mentioned, right? So uh, I think it's- What part of poor planning, Adriana? Which part of, what, what do you, um, can you elaborate? Yeah, so poor planning in terms of defining what is the evidence, uh, 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 the evidence that needs to be generated to validate your commercial model, right? Your business model, right? And who, who does that involve? Is it the, if you consider a payer as a potential buyer of your solution or a portion, a buyer of a portion of your solution, right? Um, have you validated the, those metrics of interest, right? Have you proved in real world setting there's uh, uh, that the solution affects the uh, those outcomes that will entice the, um, the the payer to consider that as a high value solution for 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 their formularies, right? So, uh, and the the way to do that is to very early on in uh, when you're designing the solution is uh, include input from all the stakeholders into the design of the solution, right? Into validating. Um, those uh, uh, those those assumptions earlier in term of uh, in terms of on the, on the clinical side and on the economic uh, side as well. I would say that's that's the the big factor hindering companies from spending the the time and the money where where they should early on. But but I also not to be like you know sort of hampering on the consumer side of things, but like there is a lot of examples today of companies that started out sort of in the wellness space as a computer or as a consumer uh, sort of play, like the aura ring comes to mind, right? They weren't taken very seriously until they had an enormous amount of data. And now they're being sort of implemented into health solutions in a big way because right. the kind of data that they bring to the surface is quite literally revolutionizing the way we look at some diseases and pathways and I, vice versa the other way when we're talking about innovation a lot of times we're talking about building from scratch from a new problem but one thing that has like blown the world in 2021 was really the fact that levels and 5,000 competitors started selling the Dexcom or equivalent um, for just general use uh, levels had 250,000 people on their wait list when they released their first version. And you're sort of thinking, wow, you know, any company should be happy to have a wait list. But this was for an old school glucose monitoring device that years sure. ago we have to have a prescription for. And I, I'd look at your uh, audiology as the same, right? So we just had an FDA ruling uh, that, that transitions this to an over the counter space. These things that we have in our ears today. Uh, from uh, you know, from Apple and from Samsung and 
from all of the different vendors that are that have been building speaker technology for the ear now can interface with all of these companies that were supposed to be building audiology equipment for and and we can use care in the home virtual audiology uh, to titrate those people can actually decide on what works best for them and we can empower the consumer to do this type of work that's a huge transition that started with companies like Yergo going direct to consumer and Best Buy investing in that space. But the important thing is when we looked at trying to transform the VA audiology environment, where it's the largest audiology practice in the United States, they we really struggled with how do we do services and buy devices with two different colors of money and orchestrate across both of them. Now I think we have the opportunity to say, how do the, how does this all work together so that folks can get what they want when they want it, where they want it. And you're also seeing the, the interplay, right? Like Bose is an investor in meth riddance. They're looking at help alleviating stroke um, issues. I think we are, we're really gonna see a lot of interaction and it's gonna be uh, much, much harder to draw the lines. And I think some of the categories we have today will have to be altered. Even because when we look at wellness, it has a little bit of a ring of, something it's sort of like serving cake it's nice but it's not really needed right i think wellness yeah, can, is a category where there's there's a tremendous amount of efficacy involved in in that project we used to run the telephone lifestyle coaching program at optum serve for the va and it was a, a very kind of rubric structure not thinking about kind of the holistic uh, coaching environment that, that you're starting to see in other wellness um, spaces uh you know, the, the, way, the way I think about um, the transition of uh, services and now being able to get to where people are is, has um, just exploded in terms of capability because of the pandemic and because of people's willingness to take on um, different types of virtual care and actually expressing preferences for you to meet them with where they are with culturally appropriate care. So, so that, that transition, even at the VA where we called it Health Promotion D Disease Prevention, National Center for Health Promotion Disease Prevention was kind of derogatorily called the hippy dippy space where now you know, we, we have to completely rethink how we talk about this and as a, as a, you know, a this dogmatic clinical culture meet patients where they are and their caregivers so that we are giving them what they want when they need it again, where they want it. I want to ask another question here, which is between market, uh, you know, when you're doing this innovation and you're trying to get there fast, you're trying to stay ahead of the competition. And in many early stage ventures or early stage ideas, you have this, you know, um, phrase called being a market maker, especially in kind of disruptive approaches where you're doing something new. Um, and there's also a phenomenon of being a fast follower. And they both have different dynamics. Being a market maker is you have to worry about IP. You're doing a lot of potentially groundbreaking work, but not necessarily uh, in terms of clinical trials and demonstrating efficacy. But um, but the fast follower can use predicates in in uh, at least under the devices realm. Um, in the wellness area, there's a question: do you, Does being the market maker uh, get you the branding foothold and positioning, which is virtuous and then makes it hard for a, a follower to come up. And in the platform play, there might be uh, similar dynamics. Does the system incentivize people, uh, meaning the FDA uh, and potentially European kind of regulatory agencies, does it incentivize a slower innovation process? Because you have to do so many more things and then you can launch and your competitors can catch up. And are we always gonna be stuck with this fast follower dynamic? Meta, you started your early stage or you started from this early stage idea. What do you think and you're creating something new? So it's an interesting uh, dilemma, right? Like we actually originally went the FDA pathway um, and then they, during COVID, changed a lot of policies and we changed the scope and we actually went after not being regulated. So we now have the FDA words that we, we are outside of regulation. 
Um, and so from our perspective, the reason we took that stand was really because we thought this way we can start getting to market now instead of having to wait for it. And so it's not so much that it's blocking, but it is taking time, right? And time is money. Um, so in a way, the, the processes that are in place for good reason um, around do no harm um, does hamper sort of how fast you can run. And I think as an entrepreneur, you want to try and get to market and commercialize as fast as possible. So I do think we'll see the wellness category um, be, be broader and broader because there's a lot of places where you can interact without necessarily um, having to interact with the FDA. Dev, you're, you're in a specific framework right now. Does that impact you? Yeah, I, so I, I see it from the innovators perspective because I work with a lot of the companies that come in to try to, to, try to commercialize and particularly build a federal marketplace. Um, I also see it from the systems perspective and how do you put together the infrastructure to enable these companies to come to market? And, you know, I'll just say, Commissioner Califf funded my initial work around how do you build a longitudinal patient record when I was at Duke um, years ago as an NIH uh, clinical roadmap fellow. So I, I, I think we, we are going to continuously struggle with this. Um, you know, we're on, a, again, a journey, but having the data infrastructure and the information exchange available to build um, a market view of not just the clinical effectiveness, but really the entire kind of value of the product or service transformation is is the um, you know I think I, Adriano is, is is exactly right. It's around thinking about and building your hypotheses for evidence generation as you come to market and understanding the regulatory framework and the cash flows and all of those pieces are going to be critical for you to be able to succeed in bringing something all the way to market and without, you know, a Medtronic coming down, sorry to name one, but someone, someone large to come jump down on top of you and shut you down by building the same thing. Spot on. Yeah. I, I would just take a swing at this, uh, you know, uh, by mentioning trust, right? So if the product is trusted by the, 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 the user, by the patient and, 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 and by the physician, I think ph physicians are, are the gateway, right? For large scale adoption of this, you know, medical grade products. Um, and, and so when you're talking about a uh, wellness company that wants to get into the regulated healthcare space they are, we I'm, I'm seeing a huge movement in that direction uh, and supporting clients in coming to market under those those conditions and through that pathway they already have a method like you were saying this consumer products like aura ring the whoops of the world feel therapeutics they started as a consumer product wellness product they have huge amounts of data they collect signals that uh, there might be a, a, a an intended use that is um, uh, it's more oriented to you know provide care or assist care or to drive decisions in care, and so then they start this pathway of okay in order to bring a software as a medical device for clinical decision making uh, as their next level product. Uh, FDA is the gateway. There's no way around it, right? So and that's the first milestone is. Uh, to uh, understand what what that um, those evidence requirements are just to get into the market. Uh, and FDA has been uh, a, a friend to us, right? They will not tell you what to do, but they will tell you what you must do to start playing the game, right? But they won't... Uh, advise you on if you're what you're doing beyond you know clinical meaningfulness and patient safety they won't advise you beyond that it's up to the innovator to figure out the the, the rest of the milestones that uh, will will make your product relevant and uh, and that will uh, you know create and support this sustainable commercial and and and, and business model um, so you know and, and and to wrap up is um, you know, 
FDA uh, is definitely a friend. Is that there's no way to go go around that, but there's there's deep thinking that needs to be done in 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 figuring out the rest of the model for 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 the solution. Uh these are some amazing insights. Appreciate uh, everyone's time on the panel today. Um, we are going to send a, a, a kind of a summary of some of the key points. Uh, and if anyone has any questions, finally, to make sure you add those into the Q&A box uh, so that we can um, collect those and, and view on that. But it's uh, I feel like this is still a, a tip of the iceberg of what's out there. Um, everyone is chasing innovation to improve things um but it's it's a complex space so we're uh, looking forward to have more of these conversations in the future um and so with that i want to thank everyone's time for joining today and um it's an exciting time to be in the medical technology and healthcare space and we'll speak with you again soon thank you thank you so much thank you, thank you everyone you.